This is the fourth recording on the homeostasis and the plasma membrane unit for students in Mrs. Stout's biology classes at Limestone Community High School. In this last section, what you're going to be looking at is cellular transport or the movement of materials into and out of the cell. Your focuses should be to be able to explain how diffusion works, how passive transport works, and how active transport works, and why that even matters to cells. You also should be able to predict the direction of diffusion of a dissolved substance when given a diagram or image, such as the ones that are appearing on your screen now. Now with the image here, um, I want you to notice that passive transport actually includes two different types. It includes diffusion and facilitated diffusion. But what you should notice with both of them is that you have the materials going from an area of high concentration or where there's a lot of them and they're moving to an area that is low concentration or where there isn't a whole lot. Active transport on the other hand and if you look at the diamond shaped molecules they're going from an area of low concentration where there isn't a whole lot to an area of high and you'll see this molecule right here ATP that is your energy molecule molecule excuse me ATP is the energy molecule whenever any energy has to happen ATP is what makes that happen um, ATP, if you really want to know, stands for adenosine triphosphate. And when you get into um, your anatomy and physiology class, your junior or senior year with Mr. Clausen, he will talk a whole lot more about the Krebs cycle, which is when ATP and the energy cycle happens. Now, separately, I am going to put up um, the PowerPoint slides on another post and you can oops, um, you can actually click this link right here it doesn't work in the video but if you click it in the PowerPoint slides it will take you to another YouTube video about cellular transport um, and it can just help enhance your knowledge of the information presented so first we're talking about diffusion Diffusion, before you can fully know it's just going from an area of high to low, you need to know some of the facts and some of the theories behind it. The first one is called Brownian motion. Brownian motion states that all particles, both living and non-living, move constantly and in random patterns. And this is happening all the time. Um, this, you can really tell... For example, and I'm going to get kind of gross here, if we are sitting in class and someone is sitting at one of the back tables and they fart. Now, because of Brownian motion, not necessarily because of force, but because of Brownian motion, those particles, which are non-living particles, will be moving as they exit the person. And so even though those are non-living particles, eventually they are going to move throughout the room until everyone gets the joy of smelling that person's fart. And that actually itself is diffusion. The um, fart particles as they exited that person would be in an area of high concentration and they would be dissipating or diffusing throughout the room to a less um, crowded area. So I know that's kind of a gross, very base example, but it gives you a good idea of what happens in diffusion. Diffusion occurs when the random movement, so it's still random because of Brownian motion, of molecules evens out the distribution of that solution. And overall, the movement of molecules is from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And that is called going with the concentration gradient, going from high to low. So looking at this diagram or this image that's on the bottom, so we can kind of label these A... B and C and they would be like a time lapse so you would pour the solute the red particles on the left side of the container and the blue particles would represent water and then over time those particles would diffuse across until they are evenly mixed which is what is happening in C Now, Brownian motion did not say that those particles would continue to move until they're equally evenly distributed. It's just they continue to move all the time. 
So if we go back to this image down here, to the A, to the B, to the C, we poured the particles into the left on A, they diffused across at B, and at C, they were evenly distributed. So let's pretend that we had another container, and we wanted to label it D. What would happen in D? What would it look like? Would it look like B, but all the materials moving all the way over to the right? Would it look like A, with all the materials gathered back up on the right? Or would it look like C and stay evenly mixed? So go ahead and hit pause and just kind of think about it and come back. All right, so I asked you what would happen if we had another container labeled D over time. According to Brownian motion, those particles would still continue to move. And because of another theory called dynamic equilibrium, there would be no further change in composition. So those particles would continue to move, but letter D would look just like letter C. The particles would stay evenly mixed. So the dynamic part, that part of the phrase means to move. If something is dynamic, it's moving um, or movement. And equilibrium means balance. So it's continuing to move even though the overall can, um, concentration will stay balanced. Diffusion across the plasma membrane can happen just through those, um, right across the plasma membrane in between those phospholipids. Small things like water and oxygen can just diffuse straight across that plasma membrane and they don't need a protein channel to do that. Osmosis is a specific type of diffusion. Osmosis is referring to the diffusion of water across the plasma membrane, and it's called, and again, we go with the concentration gradient. And there's three different types of solutions that we're going to talk about here. We have isotonic solutions in which water will continue to move back and forth, but no overall change in concentration will happen. Iso from Latin means same. Then we have a hypotonic solution. Osmosis will occur, so water will move into the cell. Um, hypo means low. And that's because the amount of water in the cell is lower. And what is known as turgor pressure, or the amount of pressure pushing against the cell membrane, will go up. And then the last one is a hypertonic solution, and hyper means higher. And in a hypertonic solution, you're going to have more water outside of the cell. And so what will happen is, or excuse me, you have a higher concentration of water in the cell, and so water will move out. That process is called plasmolysis, and the cell wilts. Um, so I encourage you to draw what this would look like in your notes somewhere, and... I'm going to kind of, I guess I'm going to try to do it up in the top here. So in an isotonic solution, this is what it'll look like on your test. You will have a container and you will have a pretend cell. The square is the pretend cell. The number that is written is going to refer to the amount of water. So let's say that the concentration inside the cell is 2. The concentration outside of the cell is 2. Well, because of the law of Brownian motion, that water will continue to move. It's going to flow into and out of the cell at an equal rate. That is an isotonic solution. Hypotonic, doing the same general idea. We have our, our container, we've got our, our cell, the square is the cell. So there's a lower concentration of water in the cell, and so water is going to move in. We're going from high to low. And so what we're looking at is what's going on in the cell. So let's say, Inside the cell is 2, and outside of the cell is 6. Would you agree that 6 is more than 2? Yes. So water will flood into the cell. Turgor pressure will increase. So this is a hypotonic solution. Hypertonic solution. Again, we have our container. We've got our cell. But the concentration of water in the cell is higher. So we're looking at what's going on in the cell. So let's say we've got a concentration of 8 in the cell and a concentration of one outside of the cell. So it's higher inside. So water will move from high to low, it will flood out of the cell, and the cell will shrink. 
So that is a hypertonic solution. Now I know this slide kind of looks like a hot mess, so feel free to pause and draw things where you need to draw them so that they make sense to you. But this is isotonic, same concentration in and out of the cell. This is hypotonic, inside the cell the concentration is lower. And this is hypertonic, inside the cell the solution, excuse me, the concentration is higher. Feel free to pause and get all this stuff written down as needed. Um, well, some of my borders didn't work here. So we have two containers, and there's a semi-permeable membrane extending between, or extending through the container. Um, and what this is showing is you put, the red part is going to be solute. The red part is solute, and the blue parts are water. So we have a higher concentration or a higher number of water molecules on the right. So over time, they are going to dissolve across or diffuse across the permeable membrane until it's an equal balance. So this, even though they're not at the same level, would be considered equilibrium because the concentration would be the same. So water would continue to flow back and forth at an even pace. Here's another example of what's going to be happening in those cells. And I'm going to try to change colors here because I know the yellow is a little bit difficult to see. Um, in a hypotonic solution, you have a lower concentration in the cell, so water is going to go inside the cell. Now, an animal cell, remember, only has the plasma membrane. It does not have an additional barrier. So if you have a... Uh, like a blood cell, for example, that you put into water, water is going to flood in and that blood cell will burst. Plant cells, that turgor pressure will go up, but this is what's normal. This is why plants um, can you know, be pretty tall without having any sort of bones for support because this cell wall becomes very firm as the water presses against the outside of it, but it does not rupture. And that is called turgid, so turgor or turgid. Isotonic solutions, you have your concentration the same, both inside and outside of the cell. In an animal cell, this is normal, so water will flood in and out at an even pace. In a plant cell, this is not ideal, but it's not too terrible. Um, you'll see this when plants are starting to get a little bit droopy, and that's because water is flowing in and out at the same rate, but there's not a whole lot of pressure pushing against that cell wall. And then finally, we have the hypertonic solution. This is where you have a higher concentration of water outside versus, or excuse me, inside versus outside, same as in plant cells. So water will exit the cell, and this is what causes cells to wilt. Um, you know, when your skin gets dry and flaky, this is what's happening. When you see a plant fully wilt down, the plasma membrane is actually separating from the cell wall, so that turgor pressure is pretty much gone. Again, in the, not the video part, not in these recordings, but in the actual um, PowerPoint, you'll be able to click on these links and watch video of this stuff actually happening. Our last one is, is no, is this the last one? I think, no. Um, our next one is passive transport. Passive transport is another, basically um, diffusion is included in passive transport. No energy is used by the cell. Um, and again, we're still going from high to low. You might have to use a membrane protein for facilitated diffusion. This is just larger materials, but you're still going from high to low. Um, all of these blue links here, you can click on them in the PowerPoint to see how they work. But like I said, we're still going from high to low. And then the last one is active transport. In active transport, you're going against the concentration gradient, so it does require energy, so your materials are going to go from an area of low to high. So imagine moving in a crowded location. 
there's our energy molecule again that will be 